Hey everyone, Azim here. This is chapter 16, spinal cord and spinal nerves. We're gonna go over in this first video, the spinal cord, gross anatomy, and where neurons and axons and all the different parts of the neurons are found um, and where they go to. Uh, and then spinal nerves will be in the next video. So we'll look at the major features of the spinal cord and how it's organized because the nervous system, especially the brain and spinal cord are very organized. Um, we'll identify major spinal nerves and the regions that they innervate. And we'll also distinguish between gray matter, white matter, things called horns, things called columns uh, within the spinal cord section and, and look at both histology and gross anatomy, as I've mentioned, of the spinal cord. Uh, I hope you've never experienced this, at least maybe the second picture here, but if you've ever experienced sciatica, sciatica is where you, uh, whoops, where you have a shooting pain down your leg. And that shooting pain down your leg isn't because you hurt your leg, it's because you've damaged and are pushing on a nerve that starts in your lower back, your lumbar sacral region, and because you're damaging that nerve, you feel a radiating pain down your leg. That's called sciatica because you're hurting your sciatic nerve. Or maybe you hurt your funny bone. When you hurt your funny bone, you're really just tapping on your ulnar nerve. Your ulnar nerve is on this medial side of your arm. When you tap this specific part right here, you hit it hard enough, you'll feel a tingle down your anabrachial manual region on the medial side and you feel this tingling or pain, that's because you're, you're hitting the nerve. That's, that's your funny bone. It's not actually a bone, it's you're hitting the nerve. In both of these cases, what this represents is that you're showing a mapping of, of where these nerves innervate. There's a very specific map that's consistent with everyone of where these nerves innervate. So we'll understand the spinal cord and the nerves that come out of it, just like we, we previously went over the brain and the cranial nerves that come out of it. We're going to understand the spinal cord and the spinal nerves that come out of it in this chapter. The spinal cord, a reminder, is part of the central nervous system, the CNS. Because it's part of the central nervous system, like the brain, it's an integrating center. It makes decisions. It's not gonna make complicated decisions like your brain does. We can make super complicated decisions with our brain, what we're gonna wear today, what we're gonna to eat today, what we're gonna to do today. Those are pretty complicated. When I say decisions, it could be as simple as moving a muscle or deciding what to do when you feel pain or itch or something like that. That's what I mean by integrating center. It can function independently of the brain. When you have spinal reflexes, like when you do that knee jerk reflex, when you tap the patellar ligament and you kick your leg out, when you extend your tibia patella femoral joint, that's uh, a spinal reflex that does not involve the brain. <clears throat> that's what I mean by it can function independently of the brain. Despite it be being able to function independently of the brain, it does not require I mean, sorry, it, it does not require brain integration, but it can relay information to and from the brain. If I want to feel something with my right hand, it can get processed in my left brain. Or if I want to move my left hand, that's because a signal was sent down from my right brain, my primary motor cortex, down to my left hand. Tying this in with what we've learned before about the skeletal system, the spinal cord is protected by vertebrae. <clears throat> Take a look at this picture down here. Uh, this side is the anterior side of a vertebra, and here's the body of a vertebra. And so the spinous process is pointing this way. So we're looking at it in this kind of tilted axis. The spinal cord runs vertically in the intervertebral foramen, in the intervertebral canal. It's protected by that, well, sorry, not intervertebral, excuse me. It's protected by the vertebral canal. Intervertebral is going horizontally. That's, that's a different one. That's for the spinal nerves. But vertebral canal runs vertically 
that's what is protecting the spinal cord. That vertebral arch is forming the vertebral canal. If you take a look at this uh, drawing on the right side over here, you'll see that the spinal cord actually ends around L1, L2. So there's still a vertebral canal that goes past L2. So there's a vertebral ca canal in L5 and the sacral, sacral, the sacrum, excuse me, in the sacrum. But in that area down here, it's just spinal nerves. And we're going to get to that coming up. So the spinal cord, the actual part of the central nervous system ends around L1, L2. And it's protected up to that point. And then past that point, you have spinal nerves hanging off of the spinal cord. The spinal cord starts at foramen magnum. It starts at foramen magnum. So that's where the medulla oblongata of the brain ends, and it just continues on as the spinal cord. So the spinal cord is just a continuation of the brain. It's just, you know, we as humans like to divide things up. We've decided to call that extension the spinal cord but it's still just one continuous piece. Given that it's continuous, it's also continuous with the meninges. So the dura mater, arachnoid mater, and the pia mater, that's all continuous along the spinal cord. The spinal cord also has pia mater, arachnoid mater, dura mater surrounding it. Oh, and here's a, another rotated view. Here's a posterior view. You can see the spinous process formed this way, spinal cord protected by the vertebral canal. In terms of the gross anatomy of the spinal cord, it's not just one straight line. It's actually got texture. So if I exaggerate it, this is not to scale. There's bulges. There's narrow portions and there's bulges and then it tapers off at the end. The first bulge is called the cervical enlargement. It's between C5 to T1. So like in this region right here, that's the cervical enlargement. It gets bigger in this area because there are more neurons going to and from the arms. So because there are more neurons, therefore more cell bodies and more axons going to and from the arms, you need more spinal cord matter. You need more nervous tissue. So it's bigger in this cervical enlargement area. It gets bigger again around T9 to L1. T9 to L1 towards the tail end. This is the lumbosacral enlargement. It's in the lumbar sacral area. It's more caudal. Lumbosacral enlargement. And similarly, just like how we had lots of neurons going to and from the arms, we need lots of neurons going to and from the legs. We don't need a whole ton of neurons in our thoracic abdominal pelvic region. While this is a very big area, this part of our torso is pretty big, you don't need as many neurons branching to it. When you go to our arms or go to our legs, there are a lot of tiny muscles, a lot of things we need to feel. There's a lot of receptors in our hand, there's a lot of muscles in our arm, and similarly for our legs, so you need a lot of neurons. The very end of our spinal cord tapers off. It forms kind of like a cone. Imagine a little ice cream cone right here. This little cone, whoops. This little cone here, this is called, whoops, that's not it either. There it is. There it is. Okay. This little cone is called the conus medullaris. Conus means cone. Medulla medullaris means center portion. Just like we have the medulla oblongata or the medulla of other glands that we're going to learn. The conus medullaris is the center portion of the spinal cord. So it's just the tail end and it tapers off. This is the center portion that we're left with. That's the most caudal portion. And remember, conus medullaris, the end of the spinal cord, ends around L1, L2.
hanging off, or let me back up, hanging off of all parts of the spinal cord, we have spinal nerves. There are pairs of spinal nerves coming off of every segment of the spinal cord. And we're gonna learn about these coming up. This is not the appropriate number, but I'm just gonna draw these in here. But when we get to the conus medullaris, there's a lot that come off and they hang farther, more caudally than the very end of the spinal cord. This is known as the cauda equina. I've skipped this film terminology. This is known as the cauda equina. This branching of spinal nerves hanging off the conus medullaris. It looks like a horse's tail. It literally means horse's tail. Cauda means tail. Equina means equine, means horse. Um, so cauda equina, these are the sacral coccygeal spinal nerves hanging off of the most caudal portion of the spinal cord. If you take a really close look, let me erase this. If you take a close look at the tail end, the conus medullaris of the spinal cord, you'll notice a very thin filament. Filum terminale literally means ending filament. It's a slender filament of pia mater. So the pia mater covers the spinal cord and then fuses together and forms a very thin line that connects down to the coccyx. And it's there to just stabilize the spinal cord. It's to hold it in place. I think this will make more sense if I show you a uh, cadaver spinal cord example. So let me clear this and switch over to that. All right, so here we can see, and thanks to University of British Columbia, we can see the spinal cord that's been dissected. The part that's been spread open, so you can see this whole piece that's been kind of flapped open. This is the dura mater. If we were to look closer, which we will coming up, we'll see the arachnoid and pia mater. You can kind of see the enlargements. Again, it's not as exaggerated as I drew before. Here's the cervical enlargement. And then the lumbosacral would be down here. And then the conus medullaris tapers off down here. Actually, hmm, I think I flipped that, excuse me. This one is a cervical. This one is the um, lumbosacral. How do I know that? How do I catch my mistake? The way that this is kind of cut off at this end, it's just flat. It doesn't taper off. I'm on, the tapered off portion is over here. That's how I know that this side is the caudal end. So this side is rostral. The side is caudal. The caudal end is tapered. So this is the conus medullaris. And you can see the beginning of the cauda equina. <clears throat> you can also see all the spinal nerves branching off in pairs at all these different levels. If we go to that caudal end, here's the conus medullaris. And look at this extension of the conus medullaris that I'm going to color in pink, the very, very tip, and it continues. 
I know it looks like a spinal nerve. Everything around it is a spinal nerve, but what I've colored in pink there, that is the phylum ter terminale. While everything else, all of this, all of this, these are spinal nerves that are no different than the ones that come out here, but these are all just bunched up together and they're hanging more caudally than the ending of the spinal cord. So we just give the term, the term that we give to this is the cauda equina. If I clear this and let the video run, you're gonna see them pick up the cauda equina. I'm sorry, the, the film terminality. There we go. There's a film terminality, just what they've moved along there. Everything else is a spinal nerve. The film terminality is made of pia mater. Everything else, nerves are made of axons and the connective tissue covering it, which we'll review coming up. Coming back to our slides, slide. Coming back to our slides, we see uh, a cross-sectional anatomy of the spinal cord. So this is what we see here. This is a cross-section of an actual spinal cord. So this is a bit of histology and a bit of gross anatomy. What we notice, if I can trace over, over what we see here, the spinal cord overall is an oval shape. Actually, let me redo this. The spinal cord is overall an oval shape, but there's a little bit of a cleft right here on the top of what we see right now. And then on the other side, there's this big gap that comes up like that. And there's a hole in the middle. The hole in the middle, that is the central canal. That's that space lined by ependymal cells that contains cerebrospinal fluid continuous with the ventricles of the brain, starting from the medulla oblongata, stretching all the way down the spinal cord. On the posterior dorsal side, posterior and dorsal in this case mean the same thing when we're referring to the spinal cord. So those terms are interchangeable. On the posterior dorsal side, we have the posterior median sulcus. Just like how we have sulci in the brain, there's a sulcus here in the spinal cord. It's a septum, little wall, has glial cells, astrocytes forming the pia mater, um, continuous with the sulcus in the medulla that we see separating the pyramids of the medulla. On the other side, that really big gap right here, this is the anterior median fissure. So we say fissure because it's a bigger hole. Well, not a hole, but a bigger wrinkle. It's bigger than a sulcus. And in that space, what's the benefit of having a space that big? It can hold an artery. There's a spinal artery, the anterior spinal artery sitting in that little, and protected by that fissure. Now I've showed you very broadly that there are spinal nerves branching off of, at different levels of the spinal cord. Spinal nerves are exiting at multiple different levels. Um, you can see starting from C1 going all the way down to coccygeal one. These spinal nerves are mixed, meaning there's both sensory afferent and motor efferent fibers, whoops, that's all motor. So there's bundles of, of axons going to the, up the, to the spinal cord and up and away from the spinal cord and down, ascending and descending. We've learned about cranial nerves. Some of them are mixed like uh, mandibular division of a trigeminal nerve, that's a mixed cranial nerve. Here, are all the spinal nerves, they're all mixed. None of them are only sensory, none of them are only motor. They're all mixed. 
there is a numbering system for the for these spinal nerves. There's a numbering system for these spinal nerves, and it's similar to the names of the vertebrae, but it's a little bit different, and it can be very confusing. So please listen up as I attempt to explain and make clear. I can keep that and make clear what the difference is. So we've learned that there are seven. There are seven cervical vertebrae. Correct? There are seven cervical vertebrae. If we take a look at our cervical vertebrae colored here in blue, in this, take a look at the top right, we have one nerve that goes on top of C1, and we call that the C1 spinal nerve. There's another nerve that goes below C1 or on top of C2, that's the C2 spinal nerve. C3 goes on top of C3, C4 goes on top of C4, C5 goes on top of C5, C6 on top of C6, C7 on top of C7, C8 goes on top of T1. There are eight, there are eight pairs of cervical spinal nerves, eight pairs. There are seven vertebrae in the cervical region, there are eight spinal nerves. That's where the confusion comes from because one comes on top and one goes below C1. There are eight cervical spinal nerves. When we look at thoracic nerves, there are 12. And at this point, T1 goes below the T1 spinal nerve. T2 goes below T2. What do I say? What do I say? T1 spinal nerve goes below T1 vertebra, there we go. T2 spinal nerve goes below T2 vertebra. T12 spinal nerve goes below T12 vertebra. So with, from now on, when we, once, we get to thoracic, once we get to thoracic and lumbar and sacral and coccygeal, it always goes below the specific bone. So T1 goes, T1 spinal nerve goes below T1 vertebra. Lumbar, L1 goes below L1 spinal nerve, L2, and also notice how we're going below the uh, tip of the spinal cord right here. There's the end of the spinal cord. L3 goes below L3, L4 goes below, below L4, L5 goes below L5. There are five lumbar spinal nerves corresponding with the five lumbar vertebrae. There's only one sacrum, but if you recall, the sacrum is made up of five fused vertebrae. So the sacrum has five pairs of spinal nerves coming out. S1, S2, S3, S4, S5, part of that caudal equina. And then coccygeal, there's one coccygeal nerve co coming out at the level of the coccyx. Because the coccyx starts with the same letter as cervical, we abbreviate it with a C lowercase o. Eight pairs of cervical nerves, 12 pairs of thoracic, five pairs of lumbar, five pairs of sacral, one pair of coccygeal. Taking a look at back at that cross section again, let's look over at this picture right here. The spinal nerve would be coming out from either side. Spinal nerve is coming out from either side. Let me actually go back a few slides. We're on slide nine right now. Let's go back to slide five. Here's the spinal cord, spinal nerve coming out one end, spinal nerve coming out another end. Each spinal nerve comes out the intervertebral foramen, that space when two vertebrae are overlapping, or maybe they come out of a sacral foramen if it's at the level of the sacrum. Oops, slide nine. So that's what we're seeing here. Where, what I'm, where I'm drawing here in black, that is a spinal nerve. Spinal nerves are mixed. There's 
sensory axons and there's efferent motor axons. So you have some axons, let's draw the sensory ones first. You have some that are going towards the spinal cord. I'm gonna draw an example of an axon terminal here. If it's sensory, let's give an example of a somatosensory neuron, something like feeling touch or temperature or pain. It's going to be pseudo-unipolar. I'm drawing my cell body out here. If we look at the histology that we have here, here's the cell body, and then here's the axons. Oops. Dendrites are off somewhere, axon terminals off somewhere. That's what we're seeing. The term for this neuron that we've drawn here for a sensory neuron, this is a first order sensory neuron. First order because it's the first one in our pathway. It's the one actually sensing something, sensing the touch, sensing temperature, sensing pain, whatever it is we're feeling. That's why we call it first order sensory neuron. The cell body of our first order sensory neuron is found in the dorsal root ganglion. Here's our cell body. And do you see this bulge right here? And in our schematic, this bulge right here, that is our dorsal root ganglion. Dorsal, because it's on the dorsal side of the spinal cord, dorsal also meaning posterior. Root, because you can see that the axon forms a little root coming off of the spinal cord, like roots coming from a plant. Ganglion, ganglion is the term for where we find neuron cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system. It's, it's cortex or nuclei or centers for the central nervous system. Outside of the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system, we find ganglia, singular ganglion. So this is the dorsal root ganglion where we find neuron cell bodies of this first order sensory neuron. If we draw a efferent motor neuron, I'm gonna do this in red. Motor neurons, their cell bodies start in the central nervous system. So I'm gonna draw one, uh, take a look over here at the top. I'm gonna to draw one right here. It's multipolar because it starts in the central nervous system and it's going to exit out a different way, but also form form, uh, what do you call it? Its axon is gonna go in the same path as the sensory nerve. Spinal nerves are mixed. So you have axons going to the spinal cord and away from the spinal cord. So what I've drawn there is a motor neuron exiting out the spinal cord, but following that same nerve pathway, but it's exiting out a different place. We have the dorsal root right here. The dorsal roots are on the dorsal side, but we also have ventral roots, which I'm gonna color in yellow. Ventral roots exit on the ventral anterior side of the spinal cord. Because ventral, dorsal roots always carry sensory information to the spinal cord, ventral roots always carry efferent motor information away from the spinal cord. Because for motor neurons, um, the cell bodies, at least the first one, if there is a, if there is a second one, if, because of the, the cell bodies for motor neurons are in the spinal cord or brain, if it's at the level, sorry, if it's at the level of the spinal cord, if we have a motor neuron, it's gonna, the motor neuron cell body can be found in the spinal cord. It exits out the ventral root. You don't need a ganglion. So there is a dorsal root ganglion for sensory neurons, for these first order sensory neurons, but there's no such thing as a ventral root ganglion. There's only a ventral root. The cell body is in the central nervous system. The axon exits out the ventral root and combines with that spinal nerve.
Let me trace over this again. Oops. Drawing the anterior median fissure right now. Going to draw the ventral root on this side. Dorsal root and dorsal root ganglion on this side. Oops. And then those dorsal and ventral roots meet together to form a spinal nerve. There. Okay, here we go. What you'll notice about this overall structure of the spinal cord besides the hole in the middle, that central canal, is that it kind of has this butterfly shape. I'm gonna draw this butterfly shape in dark blue. It changes a little bit wherever we are in the spinal cord, but overall it's the same basic shape. That butterfly region, which I'm gonna color in blue right now, but I'll erase it. But I just shaded in blue, that's gray matter. Gray matter is where we find neuron cell bodies. The term for this region of gray matter, these are called horns because they kind of look like horns, I guess. I would have called them wings because they look like butterfly wings. But nevertheless, these are horns of the spinal cord. Horns, just like we have cortex or nuclei or centers in the brain for gray matter, we have horns in the spinal cord. Now there are different regions of horns. I'll color one region of horn green. That's the dorsal horn, sometimes called posterior horn. It means the same thing. I'm gonna call it dorsal horn. Dorsal horns have cell bodies of second order sensory neurons. What does that mean? If our first order Sensory neuron is found in the dorsal root ganglion. Can you see my pink here? I'm gonna draw a pseudo unipolar neuron. It's sensing something, oops. Sensing something over here. And then it leads into the dorsal root ganglion, excuse me, it leads into the dorsal horn. And then our second order neuron, which I'm gonna color in lighter blue. Here's our second order sensory neuron. This is gonna go up to the brain. That's what I mean by a second order sensory neuron. The cell body of the second order sensory neuron is found here in the dorsal horn. <clears throat> what I'm gonna color in a light yellow, it's this middle region. This is the lateral horn. Dorsal horn has sensory neurons, second order sensory neurons, which again, I've colored in blue, um, lateral horns, you have visceral motor neurons. I'm gonna color this in red. A visceral motor neuron controls your organs, smooth muscle of organs. If I wanna control my heart, if I wanna control my stomach, if I wanna control my urinary bladder, I want to control the smooth muscle of my airways or blood vessels. It's these neurons. And they're going to be found in the lateral horn. It's not going to be pseudo-unipolar. It's going to be multipolar because we're here in the spinal cord. So here's my multipolar neuron. And I'm going to have its axon extend out the ventral root, not the dorsal root, and go to, to its target. Finally, I'm going to color this in light blue. We have our ventral horn. The ventral horn, we have cell bodies of motor neurons. 
I, I put here lower motor neurons. We'll distinguish what that means between upper and lower uh, coming up later. But these are for skeletal muscle. We are controlling skeletal muscle. So I could have a neuron over here. Can you see my purple? Here in the ventral horn, its axon extends out the ventral root to some skeletal muscle. It's a multipolar neuron, goes out the ventral root, combines with the spinal nerve, and goes to whatever muscle it is we're controlling. That's the gray matter of the spinal cord, dorsal horns, lateral horns, and ventral horns. Where's the white matter found? White matter is actually found outside. So it's kind of like the opposite of the brain. In the brain, the cortex, most of the gray matter is found in the outer portion and the white matter is mostly found in the inner portion. With the spinal cord, it's flipped. White matter is found towards the outside. <clears throat> you can see the difference and it's not always gonna look gray or white when we have a staining because staining changes things. But gray matter, you can see neuron cell bodies here. White matter. All these little dots you see are axons with myelination. All that white space, that's myelination. <clears throat> because axons are going up and down the spinal cord, like a column, they're, they're called columns. We have columns of axons going up and down the spinal cord. These are groups of tracts within the spinal cord. And also we'll be talking about tracts uh, bundles of axons in the central nervous system, so both brain and spinal cord, that are following from, like if I, I have a specific track that goes from my hand all the way up to my brain within the spinal cord. Referring to columns, if we look at this picture at the bottom left, we can divide up our spinal cord into different columns. Your, your text probably goes into way more detail, like uh, you can see even more specific regions here. I'm not going to go into that much detail, but we can broadly divide up into three different columns. This column that I'm coloring in green on one side, this is the posterior white column. The posterior white column mostly has ascending sensory tracts. So for example, let's say you have a neuron here in your dorsal root ganglion it could go up, its axons could ascend. I know I can't show this in three dimensions, but its axons could ascend towards the brain through that posterior white column. The lateral white column is this whole region here. Lateral white column is mostly, mostly for descending motor tracts. There are exceptions, but we're just making a broad statement here. It's mostly for descending motor tracts. So let's say I have a neuron that's coming from the brain and it's coming down this lateral white column. It synapses with another neuron that's here in the ventral horn. And then this one exits out the ventral root to wherever we want to communicate. That's an example of how the lateral white column is used. The anterior white column is this region of white matter. And the anterior white column has some that are sensory ascending, some that are motor efferent descending. Um, there's many different types of tracts and we're only gonna go over some of them. I'm not gonna have you memorize every single one because there's only so much time in this class, but I just want you to know that the anterior white column can have sensory and can have motor of different types. There's one more important region that you should know about. I'm gonna color it in this dark red. This region right here, it's a very narrow region that I've colored. It's in between the central canal and this anterior median sulcus. 
This narrow region is called the anterior white commissure. We've heard that word before, commissure. Commissure is where axons can cross over from one side to the other. We have the corpus callosum where we have axons crossing over, the anterior commissure where we have axons crossing over. Axons can also cross over here in the anterior white commissure. Let me give you an example. If we have a sensory neuron, I'm gonna show it on this side. If we have a sensory neuron, this is, will be the left side. If we have a sensory neuron, pseudo-unipolar, sensing something from over here, its axons could actually cross over to the other side before ascending. The axon can cross over before ascending. There's a word for crossing over, and that word is decussation. Decussation is the term for when an axon crosses from one side of the nervous system to the other side. Decussation. We see this. This is possible here in the anterior white commissure of the spinal cord, and we're going to see it also possible in the medullary pyramids of the, of the brain. The, the, those pyramids, those white matter tracts within, within the uh, medulla oblongata, it can cross over the medullary pyramids. But here is one example of where it potentially could cross over, the anterior white commissure. So if I feel something with my left hand, it could potentially cross over to the right side and then get processed in my right brain, thanks to the anterior white commissure. <clears throat> what I've just showed you here, we're seeing again, just from a different angle right here. And you can see dorsal roots coming out. Here's a ventral root coming out. Both of them combine to form a spinal nerve. A spinal nerve is a single, well, I mean, it's not single, I mean, it's a single piece, but it's made up of many things. And, and I wanna remind you, I think we've gone over this before, but I wanna re remind you that a whole spinal nerve is surrounded by epineurium. A whole spinal nerve is surrounded by epineurium. A spinal nerve is made up of bundles of axons. A bundle of axons is a fascicle. and a fascicle is surrounded by perineurium. And then each individual axon is surrounded by connective tissue. And that's surrounded by endoneurium. Similar pattern that we saw for muscles. So let's take a look at uh, some cadaver spinal cord again, and some other models that will help us visualize what we just discussed. Here in Acklands, uh, it's got a really good transverse section, cross section of the spinal cord. What we're looking at here, you can see the body. Oops. Here's the body of the spinal cord. Here's the spinous process. So body's anterior, spinous process is posterior. And we can see the spinal cord here in the middle. Sorry about that play symbol. But you can see the spinal cord here in the middle. I'm gonna clear this so we can play it and go ahead. Going in a little bit closer. They're poking the spinal cord and you can see the roots on either side. There's two here on the anterior ventral side, two here on the dorsal side. They're pointing it out right now. They're gonna pull at the dura mater. You can see the dura mater covering the spinal cord. Now they're pulling at the arachnoid mater. 
that flimsy thin film, which means that in this space, this is subarachnoid space. And then directly against the spinal cord, you can't really pull it off is the pia mater. There is a hole here in the middle because you know how this is prepared, you can't really see it, but there is a central canal in the center. Now we're gonna look at it from a longitudinal view, uh, frontal cut, I suppose. And you can see the spinal cord extending all the way up and down the back, not all the way down the back, but up to L2, L1, L2, but it does connect up here with the medulla. We can see it's covered by dura mater and it connects up to, through the foramen magnum where it would continue as the medulla oblongata. And here's the caudal portion. You can see, you can see the spinal nerves coming out. Those are the cauda equina spinal nerves and the end of the spinal cord would be around, well, probably a little bit higher up around here. Here they've, they're cutting open that dura mater. They're peeling it open and now we're exposing past the arachnoid and we're seeing the pia mater and the blood vessels that are surrounding the spinal cord. You can see a bit of the arachnoid here. Look at that thin film right here. That's the arachnoid mater. Let's take a look at Um, histology, because we can see this also in histology, that overall shape. You don't, we can't see the whole spinal cord right now because it's too big for the slide at 40X. But if I were to draw the overall shape, something like, like this, and then the gray matter, forms a shape like this. Not perfectly drawn, but <laughs> hopefully you get the idea. You have horns in the middle, and then you have columns outside of that. This is at 40X right now. If we go closer, This is 100X. You can see the division between gray and white matter. These little dark things, those are neuron cell bodies. Neuron cell bodies are found in gray matter, while axons are found in white matter. That was 100X, if we go to 400X, we are in white matter right now. All you're seeing are axons surrounded by by myelin. It's that dot and the circle, that's what you're seeing. And so we can't see the actual oligodendrocyte here, but it's oligodendrocytes here in the central nervous system surrounding these axons. If we move to the gray matter, back up a little bit. So this is white matter. We've moved over from white matter of the columns to gray matter of the horns. And you can see neuron cell bodies here. It's multipolar. You can't see all of its extensions because this is in three dimensions and you're only just seeing parts of it. You can see a little extension here little extension here, a little extension here. But these are multipolar neurons. Uh, depending on which horn we're in, it could be sensory if it's in the dorsal horn or motor if it's in the lateral or ventral horn. Visceral motor in the lateral, somatic motor in the dorsal, or 
excuse me, say that again, visceral motor in the lateral horn, somatic motor in the ventral horn. All right, that wraps it up for this uh, portion of the video. We'll go over the rest of the spinal cord in the next video and spinal nerves. So please look out for that. Um, please let me know if you have any questions. Thanks everyone, take care.